I'm Lauren. I'm Eric. And this is a PIO vlog. Okay, and we've got a few incidents for this vlog. The first one is gonna be a golf cart fire that happened on the afternoon of June 21st. We've got some pre-rival video from a neighbor that saw the incident and called 911. Go ahead, Chief. Based on the notes, upgrade to confirm. Copy, confirmed response to 1714. The upgrade, now getting multiple calls. Just to give the weather one more time, 10 to 74. Humidity at 57, you got winds out of the southwest at three. Okay. Got that smoke in the air, uh, this would be working fire. Engine 44, copy on scene, you have a golf cart that's slapping into the siding. You're going to get a pre-connect off the tank water and fire attack. Once you're next to the truck to get water supply, 1717. 45, direct to 45 needs to come in from the north right command district. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm on scene. I understand you have a vehicle fire that's extended into the structure. Can you give me a camera report? Is it in the static? Yeah, Chief, we got the fire under control on the outside of the structure. Uh, we need to get into the attic space to uh, check for extension. So as you can see from the video, Engine 44 got a quick knockdown on the fire. Thankfully, there was no injuries and minimal extension into the multifamily home behind it. So how did you feel when I came to you and said, throw your gear in my car, we're going storm chasing? So I've never experienced a tornado. And when Eric asked if I wanted to go chase it and see what was going on in the district, at first I said, no, thank you. I'll wait at headquarters for you. Um, but after a little convincing, I hopped in the car with Eric and this is what we saw. Lauren and I are in a tornado um, I'm an experienced storm chaser, so I know we're safe where we're at. Track and the rotation on my radar screen map. Lots of calls, fire alarms, a couple water rescues, storm damage, lightning strikes. Tons of fire alarms, some electrical hazards, some lightning strike investigations, and Engine 13 just completed a swift water rescue, so it's a lot for us to keep up on. Um, I'm driving us into Highlands Ranch, and Lauren is busy filming me right now and sending out all the messages to our media. We're coming into part of the area that may have been affected by the tornado, the power's out, and all of the intersections are black. So. These intersections have to be treated as four-way stops. Lots of the calls that I'm seeing popping up now are related to gas leaks, odors, some damage, and uh, utilities are often impacted when a tornado comes through with electrical problems and with natural gas problems. And I'm guessing all these calls that are stacking up are because of that. Um, dozens of calls coming in. So we're making our way into Highlands Ranch to go see that now. Tower 18. So, that's engine 17 responding to smoke inside of a building and there's more of those calls coming in now. South University Boulevard, Tower Lauren and I were out surveying damage and came across a call that was pending. No one had been dispatched because it's uh, low priority. The person living here called 911 because their tree completely fell down and thought that it hit the neighbor's house. It didn't, the house is okay, there's no damage to their utilities, so we're gonna clear this call off our board and then go check the area for some other stuff. Um, this community isn't used to tornado damage. This is a new experience, so a lot of people don't know what to do, and a lot of them have called for help, um, activated the 911 system. 
because they're scared and they're worried about the damage. So right now, South Metro is just trying to prioritize all the calls and go to the most important ones first. Uh, we just started responding emergent right behind engine 16 because we're coming up on a closed road. This is a working structure fire in Cherry Hills Village on University Boulevard. We've got a large column of black smoke showing as we're coming in here behind engine 16. Lauren and I didn't stay on scene of the structure fire for very long because one of our division chiefs arrived at station 17 where storm damage had occurred and there was already a very large media presence that was wanting live interviews and a press conference from us. So Lauren and I responded down there. Traffic was gridlocked, so it was actually really a challenge to even get to Station 17. And once we got there, there was a bunch of news interviews that had to be done. And here's a look at what it's like from the PIO side of things to manage a press conference. Earlier this afternoon, we had a severe thunderstorm come through South Metro's district, kind of working its way from the west side, southwest through Highlands Ranch. Uh, around the time that that thunderstorm got to Chatfield State Park, we received calls of people struck by hail who had called 911 for medical assistance. Um, thankfully, so far in this storm, that's the only storm-related injuries that we have heard about. As the storm progressed into Highlands Ranch, we were notified that there was a tornado warning from the National Weather Service, and then we received reports of a confirmed tornado on the ground. That confirmation was from a storm chaser in the area who saw that tornado. Shortly after that report, South Metro Fire Rescue and Douglas County Sheriff's Office started receiving multiple reports of damage in the area here in Highlands Ranch, as well as some vehicle accidents, some electrical problems, buildings hit by lightning, buildings with their fire alarms going off, and it was 116 calls for help between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m., most of those centered here in Highlands Ranch. South Metro firefighters were prioritizing those calls with our dispatchers in order of their severity, so starting with the most life-threatening and property-threatening calls first, working our way down into the least priority calls, things like trees just laying in yards with no reports of anyone injured or no utility hazards. So as firefighters responded out, along with our partners at Douglas County Sheriff's Office, they found a lot of different things. So dark intersections that were needing to be treated as four-way stops, flooded intersections, down fences, down trees, as well as roof damage to a number of buildings, including South Metro Fire Rescue Station 17, which is behind me. The firefighters assigned to this station were already responding to emergencies when the damage occurred here, so they were not here at the time that this happened. Things that our firefighters have been responding to, again, kind of include people thinking that their homes or businesses were struck by lightning, smoke conditions inside of some of those buildings, fire alarm activations, natural gas leaks, electrical problems, and trees that are laying on top of houses. Um, through all of those events, we haven't found what we would describe as significant structural damage, nothing that has required our technical rescue team to do any kind of shoring on structures or make sure that the structure is okay. And once again, thankfully, we haven't encountered any other storm-related injuries here in the Highlands Ranch area. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Deborah Takahara, Public Information Officer with Douglas County Sheriff's Office. wrapped up a press conference for our local news as well as a live news update for the Weather Channel. We did that at the front of the fire station and back here around the side of Station 17 you can see even more damage the size of these trees that were uprooted by the tornado. The National Weather Service just sent out a tweet saying that the damage path is 6.3 miles long and that they'll be out tomorrow to look at the damage rating for the EF scale. Um, I've been a storm chaser for a Good part of my life and i'm thinking it's just ef0 ef1 damage from what i've seen i don't think it was any higher than that i could always be surprised so we're really lucky here in highlands ranch today that it wasn't more serious that we didn't have any major structural damage it looks like it's just 
kind of like this, really inconvenient and expensive stuff that we're gonna have to fix. Um, looking at station 17, they'll still be able to run out of here and continue responding to emergencies, which is a good thing too. It's a good reminder to always have a way to be weather aware. There's not always tornado sirens in every community, and chances are you might not be able to even hear it if you were inside your house anyway. So it's a good time to check and see if you're signed up for emergency notifications on all of your devices. Um, and also a good idea to buy a weather radio. So you can buy those pretty cheap, have them set up in your house and set them to alert mode. So they'll go off and, and alert you no matter what time of day it is if there's a severe weather threat coming your way. Uh, in my knowledge from being in this area most of my life, this was the highest intensity tornado we've actually had touched down in South Metro's district. There have been a few times where we've had land spout tornadoes, which are much less intense. They're closer to EF zero strength. That's more of a like 70, 75 mile an hour winds. The last one that I remember Remember, I was actually working as a dispatcher here. That one occurred in 2008. That tornado touched down near Hess Reservoir and there was a lot less population in the area at the time. It didn't destroy anything and no injuries occurred. It was just very widely visible across our district. So while we don't talk about tornadoes very often, they do happen in Colorado. And as you can see, sometimes they happen in South Metro's district. Early in the morning on July 4th, I responded to a second alarm residential structure fire in Parker. This fire originated between two homes, spread up the siding and into both of them. One house was completely involved upon arrival, the other was partially involved, and this was a defensive operation. What fire investigators determined is that improperly discarded fireworks actually started this fire. And the day before, we had published a video about our common causes of our most destructive fires that we see in South Metro's district, which I will link here to this video if you're curious and haven't seen it yet. But one of the big things that we worry about on July 4th, aside from injuries and aside from wildland fires, is that lots of times we have house fires. These fireworks are being extinguished improperly, meaning they're being placed in a trash bin and just put up against the house or put inside the garage and then they ignite. The proper way to dispose of fireworks is to soak them completely submerged in a non-combustible container. That means maybe an old metal paint bucket, um, a normal metal bucket that maybe you would use around the house or even a metal trash can full of water. You want those to sit overnight and keep that five feet away from anything that can bust just to be absolutely certain that it won't start a fire. And we're very lucky in this case with people sleeping inside these homes after midnight that no one was trapped and that no one was injured as a result of these fires. But very sadly, both homes were destroyed and those residents are displaced. One of the common questions that we get is what training do South Metro's PIOs have and specifically what kind of driver training do we get? So Lauren, what training have you had so far? So I took an EVOC course with one of the police departments and we got to do things like skid control, a cone course, and in a part where you get to accelerate super fast and then brake really hard. So South Metro is doing our first ever specific EVOC course, but it's with a twist. I had an opportunity to do it last week, Lauren gets to do it next week. And aside from the normal cone course and the things that are tied into that, we have added a fire component to this. And this course is designed for anybody who is responding to fires and has the potential to be responding emergent. And not only is it EVOC and focusing on the actual driving task itself, but it's actually memory recall as well. So for the whole part of my drive, they played audio from a structure fire. And when it was done, I had to assume command like I was a battalion chief. So this really gives everyone some good insight into what our fire officers are dealing with when they're driving alone to fire calls and having to pay attention to everything that's going on on scene. Aside from the radio traffic, then I got quizzed on some of the street signs that they had placed throughout the course as well, and they wanted to know what I could remember. So here's a look at the training that I went through. Um, Eric, would you prefer to have it where no command shows up and then you're almost acting as like you want to be? Like, like a BC assuming like command. Kind of like a BC assuming command, or would you prefer to listen to a call and then just recall as much as possible? No, I want to assume command. <laughs> Full smash. Let's do Full this. Full smash. Okay, so we're gonna play this call. This one right here. Have it. And if it ends early, just so have does it end. So he early. talk to me on the. Is he gonna talk back to this or? No. So this is this is actually one of the most perfect calls for this, um, especially if the timing works out because uh, command doesn't show up until the very very end. You hear command on scene. And then ideally you're near the end there and then you basically have to take it. And you recall and then you just come over to me and then we'll go through some of the questions because I have it on my phone. Okay. Sounds good. 
Got it. All right, when you enter in, I'll hit start. Okay. Engine 17. Engine 17, on scene 12. Two story single family ledge. So we have nothing short. We're going to be off with distraction. Engine 17, on scene 12. Two story single family. Nothing showing. No offense to them. That's the 1813. Uh, Wednesday yeah. two. Once you come to the outside and you assist the stretch, break dispatch from print. We are gonna have a fire. It's gonna be located in the basement for the arc line up. Or you stretch an inch and three quarter line off tank water for fire tech. Do the three six you have. Copy. Fire in the basement for the RP, you're stretching an inch and three quarters for attack. Setting up from the Command, tower is being bouncing. Top unit from command, go ahead. Tower 18, bouncing. Medic 17, same traffic. First two is that right, you are unreadable. Repeat your traffic. Tower 18, on team. Tower 18, split Alpha Bravo. Alpha, primary search basement. Bravo, outside truck. Command medic 17, we're off team. Medic 17, medical. Command safety 18. Stand by. Dispatch, come in. Come in, go. 360 is complete. The structure does have a basement. Do not see the act of fire in the basement. Do you have fire in the Charlie, Delta Corner, first floor? Engine 17, parked on the opposite side for guys only. Dispatch copies 360 complete that there is a basement, no active fire scene in the basement. To have a working uh, fire, Charlie Delta Corner, first floor. Command, engine 33 is on scene for staged at the plug, four houses from the fire location. Command copy, live call, engine 17. Get a nose in right here. Command engine 20 is on scene level one behind uh, engine 33. Back, yep, right? yep, yep. Copy on deck Alpha. Copy on deck Alpha. I'm going to see what you need. 360! I'm going to my helicopter. I copy second 360, Sippy. Heard the helicopter and thought it hit a bunch of cones. <laughs> Command is a 7-2 Bravo. I have a supply line way to be here. Ready for connection to another call. Here it comes. We have an engine. Sounds in your own fly. I'm here for the complete. Come on, try again. 
Charlie, can you stand by? Command from Battalion 1. Command! I'm on scene. Five oh five. It's the new time. Is it five oh five? Yep. Okay, you were beside Chief One. Transfer command. What are you talking? Uh, do you want me to do like the radio transmission? Yep. Command battalion one. Battalion one. Battalion one. Montana copy. You've got a working fire on the first floor. Charlie Milton Corner. Division seventeen. On the loose line, which the 18 split, also some side tracker search on the team that's outside. You've got Medic 18 assisting with the hose line stretch. Medic 17 has been assigned. Medical Safety 18 is getting a 360. If that's correct, give me a camera. I'll see. Uh, engine 33, water supply. That's right. Is that one? I'm an engine 20 pad on deck. Okay. So you had those units ready to go. Um, okay. Oh! Street Science. Street Science. What yeah. streets did you cross? Uh, Frank, the first and then Geneva. Awesome. What was the speed limit of the course? 35. Did you see any other caution signs or anything? I saw a pedestrian block sign and a gate sign. <laughs> One of the many questions that we continue to get is, do we have any tiller updates? Lauren, do you have any tiller updates? Well, I have an update on the training tiller we just got. We just took delivery of a 1994 Seagrave from Torrance, California, which used to be their Truck 96. So our personnel will be using this vehicle to practice tiller operations, so they'll be ready to go when the new Tiller 34 arrives. Some of you may have seen that South Metro took delivery of two brand new Type 6 engines, which we call brush trucks, and I got an update from Fleet. One of the new brush trucks will go to Brush 33. The second new brush truck will go to Brush 43. Fleet continues to work on three new Battalion Chief trucks. Those will be assigned to Battalion 1, Battalion 2, and Battalion 5. And as soon as Matt gets one of those all finished up, I'll make sure that I go out and visit Fleet so that you can get a tour of those. And then I get the cool opportunity to go and visit the SVI factory in Loveland, Colorado next week to take a look at their operation at their factory. The chassis for the new Hazmat 38 has just got onto the production line, so we're starting construction on that apparatus very soon. And SVI has been cool enough to invite us up there and they will be sending us updates on the progress of that build throughout the process. All right, now it's time for our favorite time of the vlog. We've got some patch shout outs for you. Uh, the first one that I have comes to us from Valencia County, New Mexico. This one was hand delivered to us. And the next one I have is from Paw Paw Fire Department in Michigan. And the last one I have is from S. Graveland, which is a village in the Netherlands. They also sent us a bunch of pictures of their apparatus, some cool keychains and decals, really cool stuff. So thank you so much for sending those. Okay, and I've got Cornerbrook Fire Department from Canada. I've got Porterville Fire Department. and the Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control. And thanks everyone for sending patches in. We always love trading with you all. We always love reading through the comment section too, so please give us feedback. Let us know what you want to see, and we will catch you on the next video.